Welcome to Sissy Skylines, my name is Ben and I am an urban geographer. Today we are looking at an impromptu stream after a fellow planner raised a very interesting point about a certain development in Pyrata and its transit not quite being on stream. So in this in, in this recording and impromptu stream today, we're going to take a look at the urban Japanese urban model, which is running your infrastructure ahead of an urban development, not the New Zealand model of build the urban development and think about the infrastructure for another thirty years. But we just wait one moment. Okay, so we've just got that set up. So using City Skylines and my latest city, Grand Monaco Latent Cities, which is a, which is technically ready to have the pause mode lifted, we are going to take a quick look at the, the model of running the urban infrastructure ahead of urban development rather than behind. So first of all, we'll just get a brief overview of where the city is. So the city's, this map is a user created map called the, I think it's the Grand Corvey map, and it's based around this massive hydro dam that supplies about uh, 1.4 gigawatts of power at any given time. The lower reservoir and the upper reservoir right there. Um, when hydro is not used, I usually use the big nuclear power plants, which also supply the same amount of power. 24-7 uh, so it's usually the big dull nuclear power plant which is customizable and you can play around with that the other one I can use is the Finnish EPR design scene in Finland uh, one of my largest cities has that so yeah, it's either hydro nuclear or both but coming back into the city at hand it started, I use what's called the Urban Island Twin Cities model. That is, the city is built in forms of semi-independent but interdependable urban islands, all connected together by your roads and rail, and, if the, of, and periodically ferries, if there's a river around, like in my other city, Monaco. But you create urban islands to um, help you with that semi-independence, cut down cross-city commuting, promote green space, and promote better walking and cycling, especially towards your local amenities. So the city first of all started over here with Brownville and Leighton City Centre. So that's one urban island there with its big out-of-centre retail. That's one urban island. As the, city as the city extended, we built our second urban island, Kent Heights, which is based around rural farming. And then that got extended on at Meadow Heights. Then we continued down with another urban island known as Watson Heights. It's somewhat connected back to Brownville and Poplar Hills, but at the same time it's still a semi-independent but independent urban island. Then we started laying down Poplar Hills, came around to support the industry, 
which was Ivy District, then Conifer Hills. Then we started, once critical mass started building, we started laying down the foundations to the main city centre. But then we, but first of all, we developed our first downtown, which is an urban island on its own. Then Parnell. And then the Franklin District with the MIT Trade School. Just of note, we do have our second university ready to go. It will just be built on as the population grows. As I said earlier, if you missed the live stream today, this recording will be up on YouTube and be up either tonight, Sunday, or Monday. If you are looking to join the regular streams, I do them on Monday at 8 p.m., GMT plus 13 in the summer, GMT plus 12 in the winter, and again on... I forgot what the other day is. That's a good one, man. Yeah, Monday's one. Oh, yeah. Scroll down. If you scroll down to the channel it it has it there so monday at 10 a.m gmt plus 13 in the summer plus 12 in the winter friday at 8 p.m which will be a shorter stream gmt plus 13 in the winter gmt plus 12 in the summer if you would like to make a donation they are voluntary and greatly welcome most major currencies are supported including the australian new zealand dollar in brackets which always gets forgotten donations will be used to support the channel my thanks in advance most streams are recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube and my blog, Ben City's blog, where you can check out the late, latest happenings on what my cities are up to. So yeah, back to the urban islands. So those urban islands are underway and we're now on to the big one, which is the Monaco City Centre, the Le Leisure Centre, the Beverage Centre, which is a bit of a play on the joke, Beverage. Sorry for anyone that has the last name Beverage, which is based around the Lemonade Factory, which is what you need for a summer Christmas, with Griffin Square also popping up as well. Now the way you delineate your urban islands is through your physical geography, so roads, green spaces, physical geography, and so on. But the most common way it's done is through your districts. And your district tools it basically allow you to customize your areas so which and also is required to do your parks your industry because i have the industries dlc and your unit tertiary institutions because i also have the campus dlc forest industry farming industry or which is your metals and your silicons, oil and you've got off just your general general industry. Commercial, tourism, leisure, the two usually go together hand in hand. Just one moment because the old band hammer banks come up. Commercial, uh, organic and local produce, And no commercial specialization. Office. This is a good one to get, especially if you're in uh, industry office demand is a good way to make a quick buck in return. As long as you're, you've got plenty of electricity to do it while using less workers. And your residential. The only catches with that one is the fact it produces less taxable income which is a bit of a which is a bit of a clanger so you're going to need to offset it elsewhere so just be careful with your green residential it does the hippies don't like paying taxes which is somewhat of an irony okay so infrastructure do we run at ahead of an urban development like japan does or do we run up behind and think about it for 30 years, then finally decide to do it as we love to do in New Zealand? My tendency is to run the development ahead of any urban development, whether it's in city skylines or the real world. Now, there's two reasons for that. One, 
is behavioural. Two is cost, especially when trying to retrofit. So the first one is behavioural. So I'm going to come out to transit. And it's currently showing, where am I? Buses at the moment, which is good. So behavioural. When you build a new greenfield area, or, and from time to time, a brownfield area, such as um, Al Manico, which has been done by Panuku, Development Auckland, the council's property arm, you tend to see you should be building your, your water and power infrastructure is already in place, but your, more to the point, your transit and civic infrastructure should be also put in place before the, even the first zone goes down. and before your first residents or even businesses move in. Now there's two reasons, now the reason I said for that is behavioural. If, we'll come down, you can see here at the moment the city centre is served by heavy rail, which links back to the first city centre, as well as other areas like the industry and residential. It also connects down to Kent Heights and possibly Meadow Heights later on. So you've got heavy rail, which is most efficient at long distance uh, commuting, because even with the urban islands, you're still going to get people doing cross city commuting for work or tourism or leisure. That is always going to happen. So heavy rail is your most efficient form of long, is your most efficient form of long distance travel especially when it comes to intercity or right across a region, when you're going across multiple sub-regions at that. Now, technically, uh, heavy rail also allows the share fate you're moving freight as well, which is critically important when setting down industry and also setting down commercial. Heavy rail is also, because it holds the most, although in this game it doesn't because I don't have the assets for it, a heavy rail also moves the most people when shuttling between an area. So for a real life example, Britomart to Kingsland, Mount Eden, Britomart to Mount Smart for the Warriors. So heavy rail is great there. Your next one back, now this is where Auckland is having a debate, is your light rail. Now there's two forms of it. Metro rail, more commonly known as elevated rail if it's Vancouver Skytrain. Or subway if it's New York City, Tokyo, Paris, and and if I haven't said London, London. Now the thing that catches with subways too is they can go above or below ground as well. But your metro is a heavier form of light rail when you're needing to move a lot of passengers around a sub-region. Between two urban islands that are next to each other, if the urban island model is being followed. Or you just need to move, again, like heavy rail, but you want to bring it underground so you're not consuming space. Having to shuttle a lot of people, often through a city centre area. Now the great thing is, I use the Metro Overhaul mod, which allows me to do four tracks. Two tracks. Single track. And then I can also set the iron, so four platforms. Side platforms with express, single island platforms, which is usually used for line terminations, your traditional island platform, and your side platforms. Uh, heavy rail technically has it as well. And of course you've got your above ground stations as well. So your metro rail is used for going between urban islands, as we can see here. Uh, it can be used to go across a city, but although it's that uh, metro rail is more for medium distances compared to a heavy rail's long distance. Also great for moving a lot of people at once. Now, as you can see, at the moment, the metro rail does a big loop around. There's no direct connection from Franklin to the city centre, per se. Heavy rail doesn't even reach it either. Now there's two ways that can be tackled. I can either bring a metro line across 
which is most likely to happen. Or for now, we just run bus, a shuttle bus where you got one stop in Parnell, one stop in Franklin, although I might need to set that one, and one stop in Monaco. Think of it as the airport to Botany line. Good old-fashioned bus rapid transit. Your second form of light rail, and just bear with me as I go through this. You need to know your transit options, especially when before you start putting down your zones. Is your good old-fashioned trams. Trams, 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 trams. Familiar with them? Melbourne. Classic example, instantly. Now, trams are great for... And I'll come out of this mode, because the trams are on the city... Ser oh, are, on the ser are great for at-grade running. Great for short to medium distances, but hopeless for long distance, for the sh unless you've separated your trams off the roadway. But you've just got to be wary, is because they're at street level, even with street priority, they can get stuck. But trams, and this combines with buses are great for short distance, unless you're doing bus rapid transit like we have, oh, excuse me, from the city centre to Watson Heights, this is all down a busway, to Brownville, and to the city centre, uh, like second city centre and back. But the buses only hold 135 passengers, your bendy boys, your bendy buses. When that gets to capacity, you switch over to your trams. Trams cover the same distances as the bus, same speeds too, same prob same opportunities, same challenges with on-street running, unless you separate it off. But the trams hold more passengers. We'll just come out of this mode. So if we come down here bus okay so these are the bus capacities I have from 30 to 100 I think it's 130 which are your big big bendy boys whereas your tram once your buses start packing up sorry that's uh, metro rail as you can see with metro rail I can go right up to 810 woohoo that's really moving your passengers folks Your trams, as I said, will hold, typically hold more than the bus, but not as much as metro. So starting from 105, I believe. Yeah, 105, right up. I think the biggest one at the moment is the big 270. So they're basically bus replacements when your buses are full. So what does this all have to do with running your infrastructure ahead in the urban islands? Well, this is about to be let go and put um, the simulator brought online. Notice. Development? Not yet. Behavioural change. Build your infrastructure first. Ahead. And once, and in line with the zone, so the zonings are set down. At the moment you can see residential. You can see commercial. In fact, you can see both forms of commercial. And you can, and just up to my left of the screen, office so your infrastructure is running when I hit play the trams the buses the metro and the heavy rail trains will all start running even though this is all currently technically blank land but the zones down but the point being once the residents move in once the workers move in and once the tourists are starting to be attracted what do they see first they see a bus they see a tram they see a metro rail they see heavy rail and of course they can see other things like monorail if I had built it and if it was available but it's not in this topography or geography ferries they are already there they are likely to catch it first they are likely to keep catching it while they live or work in the area and they are more likely to tell four others to go do the same you have instilled the culture instilled the behavior from from get-go yes it costs more in the capex and opex initially but you are repaid back extremely quickly through and we'll come into the second part in a minute you are paid back extremely quickly that the fact your residents and workers are already using the transit system not using their cars because the force behavioral change 
post fact if you're doing the deficit model and building infrastructure post fact is extremely hard without having to go into punitive measures such, such as congestion charging fringe benefit tax on parking or increased petrol taxes which is an extremely blunt instrument So that's why you run it ahead. Two is cost, which I've just alluded to. Yes, this has cost me a small fortune to build all this infrastructure, to build all the uh, to build all to build all these trams, the tramways. In fact, some of the tramways don't have lines on them yet. Future proofing. Yeah, I know it's a word we don't like, but it's future proofed when the area expands and the buses get overcrowded. It's ready to go. But at least the cycleway that's already attached to it is in place as well. But yes, it has cost me a small fortune in capex, and it's going to cost me a small for fortune in opex initially to have all this infrastructure in place before the urban development takes off. Because if I had zoned all this first, then try and put and maybe just put in a couple of buses and that was it when this fully develops up to something like over here and I've already had to retrofit this area once by because I committed an error oh, let's go to a resident a nice big chunk this is all light residential or oh, here you try and retrofit that back with light rail, trams, which is at surface, which is usually your first step in replacing buses, or metro rail, whether it, it, above or underground, it doesn't matter, as we're finding out with the city rail link. It's still going to cause disruption one way or the other, you're, because you're either t doing cut and cover, tunnelling, but it's still going to cause disruption when you place down the stations. I'm still going to have a building demolished somewhere. So the retro, you try and retrofit this city centre once it's fully developed with either light rail or metro rail, or if you're silly enough, heavy rail, and you watch the cost and fortune that it will be at least triple than what it was trying to do it before the development takes off. More to the point, and it comes to this, you then try and change the culture and the behaviour that has already been entrenched through people driving or using buses that were not up to scratch in this service because they kept getting stuck in the heavy traffic. You try and force that culture change. I can tell you right now, it's going to be nigh impossible. And that traffic congestion and that behavioural change is going to have knock-on effects to the industry because the freight can't get through, and it's going to have knock-on effects to the motorway system and the wider roading system as well. Just a quick note, I don't run motorways through to city set or six-lane roads six lane one way roads through city centres bit different with Leighton City because that was an eight, uh, intercity already there and I've built around it but as you notice with Monaco the motorways go around not through it transit goes through a city not a motorway or a six lane one lane road so yes that is the infrastructure ahead versus the infrastructure deficit model as well as using urban islands Urban islands, creating semi-independent but interdependent urban islands that are able to support local employment and local amenities and have enough density or critical mass behind them to support both, as well as the transit system to support it as well. Cuts down cross-city commu commuting. Uh, also promotes green corridors as well so you have not only a highway of roads and transits but also a highway of green corridors for nature to move around uh, as well as your informal parks infrastructure ahead not behind yes it costs a small fortune to set the infrastructure all ready to go before I even laid the zones, before I bring the game out of pause. 
but with the infrastructure already in place as we can see here before I let the zoning develop behavioral already there new residents new workers are likely to use it right so the behavior is already there from get-go transits already there cycleways are already there walking spaces is already there your new residents and workers are likely to use it from the get-go not the car and they are likely to encourage your second third and fourth wave of residents and work and or workers to do the same so it's already in the mindset from go whereas the uh, deficit model where you are trying to retrofit your infrastructure behind the fact presents not only is it more costly as we're finding out with Dominion Road very quickly it costs more it presents disruption now there is a there's a there is a caveat with light rail uh, in this case the trams and I'll show you why in just a second and you're trying to enforce a culture change whereas the initial culture was already car dependent because of the lack of transit in the first place it's a very expensive monetary wise very expensive social and physical geography wise now there as I said there is a slight caveat your buses are overcrowded you've got to drop back to trams well I shall do a quick example I'm just going to make sure there's no buses down here nope I can do it say this bus these bus lanes here get a bit overcrowded the buses are full, the bendy boys can't handle it. Every three minutes, 135 passengers can't do it. But my trams can move to 70 passengers at the same amount of time. So it's just about double bang for your buck. So retrofitting. Expensive? Yeah, it's going to end up expensive one way or the other. Do I have the behavioural issues? Technically no, because they're already using buses, but your citizens and workers are complaining the buses are too full. So the behaviour is that they were already using it, but they're starting to get put off because of overcrowding so we go for the upgrade notice the corridor for the same amount of width I am dropping two bus lanes but replacing them with rail light rail trams still two general lanes but the bus lanes have been dropped and they're replaced with light rail and this will continue up connecting to an existing network and either your existing tram lines are rerouted or a new tram line is built. And so instead of 135 passengers per minute on a bendy boy, uh, per three minutes on a bendy boy, your tram is moving 277 about. So it is that caveat does sit there that in the same road corridor, same space, I can retrofit a road instead of having two bus lanes, it's now two light rail lines, one each way but still two general lanes. Although that's the, if I was a bit suicidal, a bit, bit off my tree. Actually, technically I wouldn't use that one. The one I would use is um, that one. I'm adding cycleways now, so I'm actually extending the transport options. Thumbs up. But it's still in the same space. Still in the same road corridor, which I believe, I think is, this is 20... Uh, 24, 8, 16, yeah, 24 metres across, 24 metres across, or 25 metres across. Heavens forbid, should I need to do that one, but as you see, I've chopped out green space, I've chopped out my pathways for a general traffic lane, so just be careful when retrofitting back. But as you can see, that's the caveat. Buses were full, so the bus lanes were switched out for two light rail lines and two sets of cycleways. We still got two general lanes there, so I'm not adding an extra general lane to cause induced demand. The buses would be deleted off this new route, 
so you don't have to worry about buses now mingling in the traffic. If you had to, for whatever reason, say it was, it was this route was on the way to a major bus station anyway, this is very easily fixed by car. See you later. The cars just spanned out right anyway, so they dropped down to a single lane. But yeah, just a gear, just to repair. Yeah, the caveat is there. Busways full. Bus lanes are full. The bus is going into it. So I'm retrofitting. Two light rail lines. I got some cycleway. Your greening is still there. Still got the trees. Your pathway's still there. I've actually separated the cyclists this time. But more to, more to the point, still only two general lanes. So I'm not triggering induced demand through the roadway. It's all in the same corridor. So yes, there is retrofitting and expense, but it's not as expensive as trying to... This is only 16 metres wide. You try and double the width of that, and good luck with the Public Works Act there, folks. Not going to happen, I can tell you that right now. So yeah, there is a caveat. And as far as behavioural goes, because they were already using the buses I mentioned earlier... The behavior, that behavior is still there when you switch over to light rail. This is that they're less likely to complain about overcrowding and they're likely to stay with it rather than switching back to the car and amplifying congestion. So yeah, there is that slight caveat there when retrofitting uh, parts of your infrastructure. Now why this impromptu stream today and going on about urban geography The urban island model, the deficit model, and the and the what's uh, the running ahead model. These conifers, yeah. It's because in Twitter today, a good friend of mine, who was a planner and is an urban designer. Oh, we're saving. Sip of water time. Was out at a certain development. Okay, it was Pirata Rides, which is down the road from me. Which was the biggest of all the special housing areas at 4,500 new homes. Which is enough for about 12,500 new residents on the 3 to 1 model. Three residents to a house. Average. And he showed... While bus stops had been put in, Auckland Transport had no way of funding new buses through OPEX. That is because Auckland Transport is, and the council, the tower, 135 Albert Street, is myopic in not using transit oriented developments to fund non fare box revenue to pay for these new buses. So they had the bus stops in there, so they've got half the infrastructure in there running ahead. This is the OPEX isn't there because they're not diversifying their revenue non fare box revenue streams through TODs. So half points there, 80. But the point was that this person was raising in Pyrata is that a train station was meant to be built there from go before the first residents moved in. Just like I've got a train station here for the city centre, a train station here for Griffin Square, and I believe another one was built or no there could be existing ones oh, sorry yes one for Monaco Ridge these were built ahead of letting the zoning go whereas what we're going to have with Pirata Rise is that the station is going to be an art is technically an afterthought the residents will move in. By the time the station is built, which is about 10 years the way we're so slow here, you've had 10 years of waves of new residents and possibly workers if there's a local centre in there coming in. There are no public transport options that bring you up to Papakura or to Pukekohe. They are fast and frequent as rail is in this point compared to a bus. And to bring you up to Papakura to bring you up to Poonui, to transfer to airport, to Botany, to either go to the airport, or to Monaco, to Botany, or to go further north up to Otahu, Sylvia Park, 
Penrose, Newmarket, Grafton, Bridamart. Okay, so 10 years. There will be no train station there. 10 years of waves of new residents without that there. So their likely inclination is to drive. Their culture and behavior that will be instilled into them through no fault of their own. And I have to make that perfectly clear. Through no fault of their own, their culture and behavioral attitude will be, because there was no train station put in ahead of the development, they have got no other option but to drive everywhere. Apart from maybe the most local, basic of local amenities inside Pyrite itself. But for anything else that would be in Papakura, or Monaco, or even right up to Britomart, they will drive. And no, they cannot drive to Papakura to catch the train. The park and ride's already f overflowing. It's a problem there in itself. All because Auckland and the New Zealand central government did not put in the train station before the first residents move in to give them that op option to instill that behavioural and cultural ethic of, hey, I've just moved into my brand new three-bedroom house. That's this cost me, I think, what, $750,000. I can catch the train to work. Whether it be Papakura, Monaco, Airport, Botany, or Tahu, Newmarket, Bredemont. And as each new subsequent wave comes in, they will do the same. But that never happened, because we never follow, New Zealand never followed the infrastructure surface uh, running ahead model as Japan does. We followed the deficit model. So we have technically ha hamstrung our new residents from get-go. We have not achieved Vision Zero. We have not achieved the requirements of the Zero Carbon Act. And we have not achieved the Paris Accord of getting our emissions down. Why? Because of a single station not being built ahead of the pirated development of going live. It's a mere afterthought. So you've got continuous waves of new residents that have got no option but to, ch uh, to drive. And by the time that station does come online, you've got, I don't know, by the time it does come on, let's say it's six to seven years away, we're so slow here, that's about six to seven waves of residents who for seven, up to seven years have had no choice but to drive. Now you try and enforce a culture change like that without doing punitive con congestion charging or fuel taxes. I can tell you right now, it will not work. It has never worked. And if you're relying on deadlock on the southern motorway, that's even a bigger policy failure than um, not putting a station in the first place. Whereas, if Auckland Transport and the central gov had put in the station ahead of time, connected it all up with that lovely little local bus system that they've got in there, and just apologies for one moment while I check on something. Um, if they had put it in from go, and the trains were running today, even if it's just those diesel shuttles for now, so Pukakai, Pararata, Jury South, and Papakura, it would have at least captured a third of the new residents going by train. And by the time the electrics are in place 2024, then the U would have driven that up to about half, if not two-thirds. So this is where today's stream, impromptu stream, has come from. The sheer fact that someone didn't put in the infrastructure in Pirata, and as a result, South Auckland and Auckland and New Zealand are going to wear the consequences. The behaviour that is going to be instilled is to drive, which is to clog the summer motorway even more, which is to harm freight traffic even more, which is to do our carbon emissions no good whatsoever. And this will continue with each succession of new wave of residents over the next six to seven years as they fluff around with the station. Whereas if you followed right here what you can see now, they had built the station first, 
to service that Pirata urban island, the culture and behaviour that would have happened would be the people would have been using the trains first. I am Ben Ross. I am an urban geographer. And we will see you on Monday when we let this zoning live. And get all the trains and buses running. And we'll see what happens as a result. Have a good weekend folks. And in the meantime. Drive safe.